and I'll give you a little bit of a different model, very similar. So leave it there, you tell me how to change. Let me give you a different little model that is in fact a little bit more interesting. A little bit more interesting. Same utility function, same story. But now we put land. Same story of the rice. Okay? So now we have rice of different varieties and land. We have a certain amount of land, risaia, right? Rice, uh, how do they call it? Rice pads, rice plots, rice farm, rice something, rice pad, I think. Well, uh, in which we grow the rice. Now you understand one difference, one real difference between different varieties of rice is that some of them uses less land, less ground per plant, okay? So they're less uh, voracious, they, they consume less land, okay? So obviously if, I, if my limit is the land available, having a variety that uses less land is a way of increasing output. Obviously you can tell other story. The key one is labor, right? A machine that produces a certain tool is better than another. The spinning jenny was better than the old frame because the spinning jenny used less labor to produce the same amount of textile. Right? So in fact most innovation, if one think of them, are actually labor saving, especially expensive labor saving. Many are energy saving, other are land saving. You know, we tend to save in general on the scarce factor. All right. So let's, even that we talk about rice, let's use land, okay? So right now, one way we can do is to write output of type I as coming from rice of type I that I put in there, okay? Maybe with a beta in front. And land available, okay, so, this is that's the effort of this stuff in the air, shit, I don't have anything with me, right. I'm on a ditch like that, sorry, <laughs> I mean some of the dust went in the air, okay, and so let's put the, here yeah, there is a problem of unit of measure, that's a bit of a disaster, okay, now, and land. Now, how do I explain that type I is better than type I minus one because it uses less land? Well, I multiply by this, right? Where gamma is larger than one, right? Okay? So you see, beta K and Y are measured in the same unit. Rice. So beta says that's how many unit of how many grains are there in the plant right, that you have put in the ground. The gamma allows you to transfer, say you know, one square meter of land is more productive with type I plus one than it is with type I because gamma is 1.2, so it's 20% less land. Okay? Now, if land is less or equal to L at T, L is the total amount of land available in this economy. Right? Now you can see here a story that is completely similar. You remember when I gave you the CES and we did those graphs? Now we're going to do the CES story with technological process. This produces rice, and like before, what do we have? We have a technology that produces Ki plus one T from rho Kit. And now we have to put again alpha here and one minus alpha here. We still have to choose. Hmm?
By the way, this should also suggest you what was here that was making the thing a bit complicated. One sector, two sector, three sectors, uh, goods being different becomes important. To simplify, to simplify. It doesn't change anything from the theoretical point, but it allows you to simplify. So now you see what's going on here. What's going on here? This produces output of that good that I consume. This produces the new rice. Right? So what's the idea that I want to go? And I'll let you finish. Uh, think because we don't have time. But there is, there is an equation we need to add, okay? The idea here, you remember the story we had, right, that we draw on the blackboard. What was the story? The story with the CS, no technological progress, but in fact, as we said, technological progress was the economy has a certain amount of labor in that case. It's always there. That's fixed. Right? At the beginning, there is little capital, we said, right? Capital was very little, right? Because, right, there is a certain ratio between capital and labor. Notice that here there is a certain ratio between capital and labor, right? If I have one unit of capital invested, right, then beta has to be equal to gamma times land. So I use how much land? Beta divided by gamma, right? So that defines a rise to land ratio in the CS, capital to labor ratio. Whatever that is, right, I use this much, for example. In these stories, what is that I do? I draw this. And in this story, as I accumulate more capital, there is more rise at time zero than time one then time two, I go up progressively, right, along that, right, and I employ more labor and I produce more output until I get here. Here I am producing, I have a stock of capital K star, and I'm employing all the land, and I'm producing beta times K star. That's the maximum value. At this point, you see that at this point, if gamma times rho is larger than one, I innovate. It's the only way to increase. At this point, I start doing this. And in fact, what I'm doing is, in some sense, increasing the capital land ratio. Right? Because land is always the same amount, but now I can produce more because it's like, it is as if I have more land by using the new variety. So the measurable capital to land ratio increases. Land is always the same. I'm planting more plants, right? You say, right? Beta is fixed, so gamma is bigger. This has to be big, become bigger to get equality. So kappa k increases with gamma. At each stage, more. Boom, 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 right? And that gets me more out. And so what? This looks like, it's like the CS. It's exactly, you see, it's like the same graph we did with the CS. The only difference is that here, we're doing it with a, an underlying technology that has fixed coefficient and with innovation. To move, in the CS, we move from this to this to this, up, up, you remember? Pure by substitutability, right? The production function allowed, to use the same capital with a different ratio. 
Here we tell a story that I believe is more relevant. It's not only more realistic, it's actually more relevant because it makes you understand why innovation comes around, right? And it says, no, I'm actually changing variety. Right? What I'm doing is seeking, spending resources. It doesn't come for free. I'm spending resources when it's convenient to create a variety that uses less land because land is becoming scarce. So here, variety is in the What do you want to call it? Call it leather. It's fine. It's variety. It's a quality. Yeah. This cup, this this rice uses less lead. The point is that you see there are many ways in which one good is different from another. One has to decide what's empirically relevant. Yeah. In in the development of agriculture, it's clear that the empirically relevant thing was using less land per unit of uh, output and using less labor per unit of output. Right. In other sectors, it's other things. In general, it seems to me, saving on scarce, expensive factor was always the key. Okay? And I think that is a complete misunderstanding in recent empirical literature that twists things around and says, oh no, what we're actually doing is innovating because we make factors complementary to the abundant one. So because there's a lot of people with college degree, we make computers that are usable by people with college degree. Not true. Computers came around to save on secretaries, to save on personnel, to save on accountants. Okay? It happens to be the case that all, that's another thing that people seem to have a trouble to accept, the most technologies are joint, uh, how can I say, are fixed coefficient technology. New technologies require new people. You see what I mean? It's the creation of the new technology that creates the new worker. It's not vice versa. Computers came way before there was a mass of people able to use Excel and Word and Windows and sometimes maybe understanding how the operating system does. But they're still kind of behind, right? Electric machinery was innovated, not because there were a lot of people able to use electric machinery, but because it was a much more efficient way of producing or using energy. Then people were taught how to fix electric engine. And we developed labor force capable to work with electric engines. Better stop, we're running out of time. But think about this. So there's, there's all this, I mean, it's a bit of a fight, but I don't really care, but it's a completely distorted history. Technology comes before the complementary factor, not after. In the history of economic development, the technology always came before. It was the product of a few people. A few people invented how to do chemical processes, blah, 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 you know, in, uh, from oil and blah, blah, blah. Then, a lot of chemists were trained to do that. But the technology existed. Obviously, the two have to move in step because then, typically, there are fixed coefficients. Very sophisticated technology requires very sophisticated workers. But it's not true that first you create the sophisticated workers and then the technology. It's typically the opposite. The technology breaks through and typically breaks through because it's a way of saving on expensive resources and creating new goods. And then people say, wow, that's better than what I'm doing. I better learn how to do that because that's a way of making money. And this is it for growth. So next week, I mean, next week, sorry, next uh, Thursday, 